Wait for it, wait for it, and we're live. Hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just a couple of nerdy veterans and one chaos coordinator geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, uh, we are doing uh, an interview about the Troll Lord Games Kickstarter so I brought my friend uh, Sparky on, who introduced me to the system to begin with, and uh, I understand he is now one of your wage slaves. I mean, one of your workers. I mean, a friend of the show. <laughs> I'm something. I'm many, I'm a a, a, a a gnome of many, with many hats. Yeah, no, <laughs> call him Rob. But a wage slave. I like that. So. so Sparky, is there any truth to the rumor that that nickname came because you burnt something down? Yes. Was it involving your electrical work? Because I, I know you were rewiring a cabin for someone. No, this is okay. not, no but it was my, uh, I did almost burn my house down once. <clears throat> <laughs> Wait a second. So Sparky has a meaning? Give us the yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'll have to tell that story someday. It is, it is hilarious. As well, a big they, fan of burning stuff down. <laughs> Pyromancy needs to be your new class for your gnome. Um, yeah. And you could like make it burn your own beard and stuff off. Oh my gosh! Sparky has inspired me. I need to start growing a beard now, dear audience. Um, you know, as a little, little, to the avatar. As a little side note, there, I did actually burn all the clothes and body hair off of a gnome in one of my C uh, CNC games once. So it was a successful <laughs> adventure, is that? <laughs> yeah, he, he, he dropped the, uh, this fire flash thing. He, he rolled a natural one. I'm like, you drop it. it <coughs> oh, on himself. That's pretty yep. cool. It was great. You, you do was, also have the distinction of having killed James and Ward in a game. I did have that too. That was awesome. really yes. <laughs> Good on you, plus one. He was a um a werewolf, and James was a was a gnome. I think yes, he was a gnome, and I, I, yeah. I ripped his head and, off and on and that way. Ate him. <laughs> so, all gnomes must die. <laughs> it doesn't matter who the gnome is, but yeah, all right. So so that's Sparky. That's why I peaked in life, guys. Just like so you no, know, at least it wasn't high school. From here. <laughs> all right, and then we've got our guests. Uh, we're going to start with alphabetic order. So Davis, can you introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers at home? Um, David Chenault, I work for Tortler Games. I'm one of the co designers of Castles and Crusades, the role playing game. Uh, standing in last, but certainly not least, we have his uh, equally as good looking brother, Steve. Can you introduce yourself? My name is Steven Chenault, I'm CEO of Tortler Games. I do a lot of writing, designing around here, but Davis sold himself short. He's one of the original founders with me and Mac Golden of Tortler Games. Oh, yeah, I remember now. I hopped my car to fund the game, fund the company. <laughs> you did. You came from from somewhere out west and some dead you were doing. I mean, you do what you got to do. So, And then how we first found them. So I actually discovered Troll Lord Games at about the same time uh, from both James M. Ward, who sent me when we were working on the series together, the De Gods and Demigods manual he wrote for your guys. Yep. Uh, and when I told people, they thought he was uh, he was sending me because he said it was an original, the original one he wrote for TSR. And they're like, dude, I'll buy that from you. And I told James that and he goes, I don't like you that much, JR. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's got, I guess, some monetary value to it. Um, <laughs> and so and then Sparky introduced it at the time we were playing Swords and Wizardry because it was a simpler version. Yeah. He's like, you ought to try this CNC game. It's, it's, it's the same thing, but cooler. So... Uh, <laughs> When time and money allow, I will definitely be buying the uh, the entire work so I can run a campaign in your game. Uh, so if, if my editors complain and my publishers complain that my books come in late, just know it's your fault, all right? <laughs> Actually, as a side fact right there, JR, you have played in one of my uh, Castles and Crusades game. Of course, then I, I didn't realize that's what the system was. Yeah, okay. and then later, uh, you're, since you only played that one session, the PC, I kind of made it NPC, and... Uh, the NPC got killed and got. It was then reincarnated as a gnome of all things. <laughs> <laughs> Did it die doing something gloriously stupid? Because that's the way to go. Uh, it was like a crossbow bolt to the neck. It was. It was. It yeah, was. Terrible. It happens. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> but, but if you're gonna do it and you're gonna die so irreverently, you got to give him like a forty-page backstory. I think that's. <laughs> Go all in. Go all in. First roll, you die. <laughs> the, the funny thing is, is some of those backstories, and I'm like, you know, it's, one, it's kind of tragic, but I get it. Nobody goes adventuring for no reason. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I killed a dragon that killed my mom, but I died from rats in a basement. Yeah. I don't know. I think, you know, saying, hey, I had to go adventuring to play off my gambling debts, you know, that's, 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 Ooh, I like that. 
my, yeah, my, I burned my house down. I got to go fix it. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was your bookies. <laughs> Oh, those are those are actually great backstories because you don't really need a complex backstory, I don't think. Yeah, no. yeah, but you need a good one, like it just and that one liner. Uh, I have to pay off my gambling debts. That's a good one. I have to. I burned down my house and I need some money. Uh, I got to remember that for NPC. It, it does. It does sort of imply the morality of your character. It's kind of hard to play a paladin, but that is your backstory. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, although. Yeah. I guess there are different gods out there, so maybe with the right god, that paladin backstory still works. Yeah, yeah. All right, Davis, before we dive into the awesome worlds that are Troll Lord games, you do have to pass the first test, and it is the religion questions. Are you ready, sir? I am ready. All right, Star Wars, Star Trek, or Firefly? Firefly. Outstanding answer. Space Westerns, they'll never take the sky from us. Yes, no. All right. Firefly and beats them all. I, I love it, and it didn't have time to last long enough to be ruined by ineptitude uh, <laughs> no, no, in the TV. Yeah, no, I agree with you 100% because, you know, it maybe could have used another season or two, you know, for fun. But the fact that it just sort of like died, it died on a high note. Okay, so you can never take that away. You can never say it just fell into obscurity or bad you know, it's kind of like all those, you know, the, the, the big uh, rock singers from the from the sixties who died of drug overdoses at like nine. <laughs> they died at the top of their game. They didn't, you know, get old and, and die in obscurity. <laughs> Although, you know, this is why they say sobriety ruined rock and roll. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the the only bad thing is, is if they had lasted longer in, in the eighties and nineties, Hollywood had this thing where they had to do at one episode they, everybody went to disney because it was filler and you had to have an episode where it became a musical for some reason just randomly people would bust in the song and can you imagine nathan fillion trying to sing <laughs> didn't star wars have a musical too yeah, uh, the, the christmas special i know had some yeah. musical uh bits yes yeah, that's really right. like i interviewed the guy that, that uh played darth i think it was darth no it was it either he played darth vader or um Boba Fett, uh, Rainbow Sun Franks, who's a is an actor who's gotten some some bigger re shows recently. His dad was in the Star Wars musical. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, his dad was an actor too. That makes me wonder if uh, it broke the dad's brain, and that's why he named his son Rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> that that you know, starts making sense to me. I always wondered about that when I watched him on Stargate Atlantis. I'm like, what? Why that's where I found him, and I interviewed him. He's a fun dude. What did they do um, that to him? <laughs> what did they do to him? <laughs> in country music, we learned about the boy named Sue, and maybe it was just trying to make him tough. There you go. So, all right. Since we are polytheistic here at the Blasters and Blades podcast, the Game of Thrones, Wheel of Time, or Chronicles of Narnia? Ooh, that one's a hard one. Uh, the uh, Dude, that's a hard question because I just watched The Wheel of Time on Netflix, right? And... I actually really, I know that show's been like hit. Like a lot of people don't like it. I super enjoyed it. I enjoyed almost all of it. So I think currently as it stands, I'm going to go with the Wheel of Time, the Netflix thing. Okay. So I, I don't always agree when people pan it. Like everyone panned the live action avatar that um, Netflix is doing in conjunction with Nickelodeon. Yeah. I am not a fanatic to the lore. I accept that they change some things when they do reimaginings, mm -hmm. but I'm enjoying it. I'm, I think the first eight episodes are done and everyone hated it. I think sometimes hating things is just popular right now. Yeah. Um, I, I can accept that uh, Amazon changed things with, uh, with the wheel of time, but if you accept it as its own property, it wasn't bad. They needed better costuming for what they paid, but. Yeah, they could. Yeah, they could have used some better costuming. But the overall, I can I completely divorced myself because it's been when did when was the Will Time published? Fourteen hundreds? I don't know. It seems like <laughs> it, was, it was ages ago, and so I didn't I didn't I didn't bring any baggage from the books over, so I could watch it completely in and of itself as a show. And I was like, oh, I really really enjoyed this. Now, but saying you know the Game of Thrones. Uh, that was a hard, like, I started it like five times the first episode before I actually finally watched the first episode. And the end of the first episode had me hooked. I mean, I was like a fish on a line and being reeled right in until about, I think it was season three or four. I was just like, maybe five. I was just like, e -e -e -e. 
So, but the Wheel of Time just kept me in, and I think they're doing another season, aren't they? Maybe answer the question, Davis. Narnia, Wheel of Time, or Game of Thrones? Wait, I want, to, I want to play all day. I'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed the Wheel of Time. I, I canceled my Amazon Prime, so I only watched the first season, but I thought it was pretty good. I think the uh, original Lord of the Rings movies. Uh, they kind of ruined us to what fantasy can look like on the big screen. Uh -huh. And so they kind of set the bar so high that we, we just don't accept the campy costumes anymore. Yeah. You know? yeah um, and, and the first Wheel of Time came out in like 96 or 97, I believe. I know it was late 90s. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. I can't God. honestly remember. It just seems like ages ago to me. Anyway, that was, that was, it was, that was like 20 years ago or something like that. So yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a couple of lifetimes ago. <laughs> this is the nineties. That wasn't that long ago, guys. God, yeah, it's only twenty years ago. So, and because we are civilized human beings, we are no longer knuckle dragging troglodytes. Coffee or tea, and how do you take it? Coffee black. I, I make myself drink the coffee black because I can't afford the calories of the creamer. But if I had a preference, I'm putting French vanilla in it every day. Ah, uh, yeah. I started on cappuccinos, and now I'm just like straight coffee black. <laughs> Oh, I enjoy a good cappuccino too, although you got to add a little bit of flavor to it. Like I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge French vanilla. I'll do a lot. I won't do anything for a Klondike bar, but for French vanilla, I, I might murder some people. <laughs> so, all right. Now that we got the introduction out of the way, I understand you guys are tight on time. So we'll just dive right in. So let's start with uh, Troll Lord Games. So how did the creation of your system come about? Uh, you mean Castles and Crusades? Or the Isn't that what I said? Yeah, well, you said Troll Lord Games, so I didn't know. <laughs> well, isn't, isn't Castles and Crusades your first game? Wasn't that what started the company? No, no. We actually started a game called Swords and Swords and Sorcery that appeared in the back of the first four adventures that we did, three adventures in a world setting. And that was really kind of a setup that Davis and Matt Golden designed that was kind of very similar to D20 because Matt knew what was coming with third edition. So we, we did that for about, well, we did that for the, just the first round of publication. And then the second round of publication, it was Dungeons and Dragons material uh, under the OGL using the SRD uh, for, for D20 material. And we did that for uh, three years or so, four years or so. And then Castles and Crusades came out in 2004 when we were warned somewhere around in 03 that there was a bubble. There was a bubble in the, in the D&D market coming and we better do something. Uh, John Nephew told, told me about that. So we began designing Castles and Crusades and it released in 2004. Uh, roughly, we'd been in year business for about five years at that point. But then, C but then CNC becomes uh, the primary vehicle uh, that we're publishing that. And at the time, Gary Gygax and we used, we published Gary Gygax up until 2008 when he crossed over. And then from 2008 up until the reason so it's Castles and Crusades all so for those that you don't know, the OGL license that he's talking about is basically the older versions than whatever Wizards of the Coast was putting out. They let you make content for them. Is that what it, correct? Because we want to make right. sure everyone understands. Yes. All right. And so now you guys do exclusively the castles and crusades. Not crusaders. Don't get it wrong like I did, people. <laughs> um, okay. So what made you create castles and crusades the way you did? Because your siege engine, I don't think I've seen anything like that anywhere else. I think it's pretty unique. Davis and Davis and Mac, and of course, he can go speak far more into the actual creation process. But we had in in 03, there were a few few pressures coming on to, to Troller Games, to the company itself. Uh, one was the the uh, bubble in the market that, that I had mentioned earlier. And Davis and Mac had been wanting to do a, a role playing game and break away from Dungeons and Dragons anyway. So there was that pressure, the bubble pressure. And then Gary Gygax approached us and said, you know, we've got I got this Castle Zaggy material. I need a system that's very much like AD and D. Uh, and when I pitched him that he could make his own real quick and put it in the back of his Castle Zaggy material, he didn't want to do it any, any part of that. He wanted us to do something. So it kind of just worked out b between what Davis and Mac were wanting to do and what Gary wanted us to do and really what the company needed at the time. Uh, so they began what Davis in 2003 started working on it, I think, something like that. Yeah, Mac and I would meet on the front porch of my house. He lived just two houses down from me at the time. And uh, we'd be down the front porch of my house at nine o'clock at night, between eight and nine o'clock at night, and then stay up to like two or three in the morning, just sitting there designing games and stuff like that, or designing this game, working on this game. Uh, that was, yeah, 2003, because we yeah, knew it. Yeah, 03, 04, and then 
you would send me rules and blah, 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 blah. And we had a lot of folks playtesting it on our boards at the time. Yeah, and there was a ton of playtesting going on. And uh, I think the breakthrough was when I actually broke down the maths of the game. And I figured out the secret code in the game, <laughs> which I won't go into. But it's in Castles and Crusades now. Which is why the game is convertible or you can convert to very easily from any rendition of the game. Yeah. Really okay. Really and you can it. come to Castle and Crusades because there is a central mathematical formula that underpins literally the entirety of the game. So when did you guys go from being a gaming company, being Troll Lord Games, and also being a book publishing company? Because I understand that you guys take the book production to, to the next level, unlike most companies do these days. Yeah, that was actually Davis's idea. In 04, I remember I, I, I flew out to a convention, 2004, I flew out to a convention in uh, San Francisco, and we had to have three books, POD, print on demand, sent to us uh, very quickly. And I can't remember what the shipping was. It was absolutely insane. It was like, <coughs> you know, two night express or some whatever it was. And it was like $240. And of course, in those days, we were a much smaller company. And I was furious, and I began just for the next several weeks hooting and hollering about it nonstop, about the cost of the books was high, the cost of the shipping was high. And then Davis was like, well, why don't we just make our own print shop? And I was like, because we can't. We don't know how to do it. And he's like, well, I don't know how to do it. And so we argued about it for about a month, and then we started <laughs> investigating and hooked up with Xerox, bought uh, an old cutter from some fella in South Little Rock, uh, rented some machines from Xerox, and began uh, printing and binding and cutting our own material. By 2005, we were up and running. Uh, 2006, we were up and running. By 2008, it was a full bore making our own books. Now, so except, for, except for the hardbacks. Those are produced out. We, and we this, did the hardback thing for about two years. It just didn't take. Yeah, it didn't take. But, but Kent, my brother, is a bibliophile, right? That guy collects books. He loves books, and he knows all about, like, not only what's in the book, but the construction of the book, right? Yeah. And I've never paid attention to the construction of a book. I don't care. It's in my hands. It'll get destroyed shortly. And that's basically <laughs> how I'm going, right? So, but Kent, he works. He that's knows all the Kent, for those of you who don't know. Go ahead, Dave. Okay, yeah. So he takes our printing. He will not accept, like, some of the binding and stuff that goes on. Oh, yeah. oh, so the quality, the actual physical quality of our books is, is super, super high. The hardback ones, for sure, super high. I'll smite sound and we'll send books back in a heartbeat. And it, yeah. And that Sparky remembers we had a whole line of monsters and treasures that came, that were falling apart, and they had to redo the whole line, of course. We were. Yeah. Is there any truth to the rumor that you pay Sparky and Dr. Pepper when he works for you? <laughs> <laughs> no, Dr. Pepper is expensive these days. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So you get like the the Circle K brand of fake Dr. Pepper? <laughs> no, 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 whoa, whoa. You're, th th that were fighting words. Yeah. All right, so let, let's dive in since the, we, we brought you on to talk specifically about, uh, you know, both understanding what is Troll Lord Games, but also your work with Gary Gygax, who some of you guys might have heard about. He created a game that kind of became Dungeons and Dragons. So how did your work with him, did he just approach you out of the blue? Were you already working with him? Like, how did that evolve? Uh, no, interestingly enough. So we, we the company comes together in 1999. Uh, and Davis and Matt Golden and I sat down at Vino's Pizza Place and began talking about this company and putting stuff together. Matt was actually deeply involved in the legal discussions with the group that was putting the open gaming license together which was being posed by Wizards of the Coast at the time to make everything open to get more people into the hobby. So uh, when we did our first round of books, which was three adventures in one setting book, uh, we lost the Gen Con in the year 2000. And unbeknownst to Davis and I, we were just, you know, whatever, going to Gen Con, trying to figure out what's going on. Matt took all of our books to Gary Gygax's booth over at Heckerforge. Uh, and gave them to him and said, hey, thank you very much. Appreciate Dungeons Dragons. It's all, you know, all the things that you do when you meet, you know, one of your idols. And then about two months after that Gen Con, Mac and I were talking about something. And he said, hey, man, why don't you shoot Gary Gygax an email and see if he enjoyed the books? And I didn't know what he was talking about. So he had to explain everything to me. Uh, so I found Gary's email somehow, or probably Mac found it, to be honest with you. And I shot Gary a quick email, you know, just say, hey. Hope you got to appreciate the books or whatever I said. I can't remember what I said. Uh, he wrote back almost immediately. 
Uh, and then Mac was on, on the other end, kept telling me, hey, you need to, why don't you see if we can't get him to write some adventures for us for D20? Uh, so I asked him and he said, uh, nope, not interested in that, but I do have these books that I would like to see published. Let's get on the phone. And probably within two or three days of that first email going to Gary, uh, we, he and I were on the phone talking about uh, the Gygaxian fantasy worlds and all kinds of projects that he wanted to do. Okay, so uh, rewarding being industrious and, and stepping out, I guess. Yeah, so, I didn't think there was any chance in hell that any of this could, yeah. could come about. But Mac was like, yeah, Davis is, yeah, you need Davis too. Uh, but Mac's like, no, 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 just give it a shot. You never know. And he was it, uh, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. That's well, true. that's, that, yep, that's true. <laughs> so, and, and now, of course, when you when you guys are taking off, you're going to get a lot of people approaching you and dropping stuff off. And now you got to respond in kind, at least give it a shot. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, you know? Yeah, I'm pretty good, actually, about responding to any emails and stuff like that. And uh, I think, Kent, you're pretty good about not as much anymore. I'm pretty good at not responding to emails. <laughs> well, <either>. any more, <laughs> yeah, anymore, Kent's pretty, like, just doesn't. <laughs> But, I will sit here at least once a day when I meet an email going, just channel Gary Gygax. Because Gary never missed an email. He, he responded as quickly as he could. Yeah. Was, I'm, I'm horrible. With it. Were the emails him or was it uh, like a personal assistant kind of thing? Oh, no, it was him. It was him. It looking, I was looking at some of the emails that he and I exchanged when we were actually doing the contractual ne negotiations for the final thing. Um, and we ended up talking about, I happened to be reading a, a book on the history of the Habsburg dynasty at the time. And he was reading a book on the, uh, the Magyars uh, settlement in the Hungarian plateau, whatever, not, whatever that's called. Um, and we got to talking about that. So they they were very personal from a very, you know, from the get go. Uh, so no, he didn't have an assistant. It was, he was pretty insistent on probably the only time I saw him get angry with us was when he thought we were, getting between him and some of the, the people who loved his work. Uh, he was very, very um, gracious and thankful for everybody that was playing. And when people would come up, talk to him or email him or call him. Uh, I, I know for a fact that several people showed and just were passing through like Geneva, got a hold of Gary and he let him sleep at his house. I mean, he was just a super, he, he was super, super gracious about everybody that was playing the game. That's always encouraging. You, you don't see that as much anymore. Um, Sometimes you see people that have levels of success that almost like they start believing their own press. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's nice to hear. So uh, I'm going to throw up the image from the Kickstarter, which is what you guys are talking about. And uh, we're not going to, dear listener, we're not doing an actual um, commercial because they're sponsoring this episode with their Kickstarter. So link for that will be in the show notes. And we're just going to spend the next whatever the time is talking about it. But so – you did this world with Gary and then I understand, you know, briefly that there was some legal disputes uh, on his estate. And, and once that settled, you guys came back into getting ready to produce it. My understanding is you're working with his son, Luke for this. Yeah. So uh, when Gary passed away in March of 2008, uh, his wife pulled the licenses later that year. She had her own kind of plan that she wanted to pursue. So we went our direction, mostly with Castle of Shades and, uh, and the estate, uh, Miss Gygax continued to do all of the work for, for many, many, many years. There were some legal issues. I'm not going to go into any of that, but there's legal issues. Uh, and it opened up and Luke contacted us and the court contacted us uh, via Luke and said, hey, uh, you know, do you have a plan or would you like to, you know, get involved in this? Uh, so we put a plan together, sent it to the court. They approved um, and um and here, and here we are again in 2024, picking up exactly where we left off in 2008. Okay. And so now that you guys are picking it off, what is the plan going forward? There is a Kickstarter. Um, it looks like the worlds are already built. So the Kickstarter is just a way of sort of funding it and getting the words out. I think Kickstarter has almost become a pre-sale uh, venue as much as funding things. Um and there are costs in, in getting a print run, I imagine. That, that doesn't happen cheaply with the cost of wood and paper these days. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, are, what is the Kickstarter offering? And then, like, what kind of stretch goals were you guys thinking about? 
So these these books, Davis, you want me to dive into this? Yeah, yeah. You know it far more intimately and can do it more logically than I can. Okay. I'm just going to go start talking about each of the books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the, the book, the, the, the series of books is uh, the guy, Gary call it, we call it the Gygaxian Fantasy World Series. And it's essentially an encyclopedia of how to's for world building, game design, module adventure design, running games, uh, creating characters, all kinds, everything that goes along with the RPG hobby, Gary envisioned to go into this series of books. Now, when he was still alive, we published seven of them. We had another three in the works and there was another three or five. I have to get my list open that were that were planned, that were partially written or started to rewriting because he really envisioned this, this, this series of books to be open ended. And it's really world building books. It's how to create a city environment. That's the canting crew. How to uh, flesh out your entire world. That's the world builder. Uh, the living fantasy is how to create a fantasy environment uh, to play your games in. Book of Names is 120, 100,000 names plus name generators and name creators. Uh, in City A, uh, the adventure building is how to build an adventure. And then you got Nation Builder and Cosmos Builder, which are how to build cosmos and nation, nations. So they're really all. Uh, how to world build books. Uh, and I remember watching about two years ago when at the height of, of fifth edition, so many TikToks and YouTubes and YouTube shows and all kinds of stuff, people talking about world building. You could see all these gamers had a huge number of gamers had joined the, the hobby. A lot of them were younger and they were just learning how to world build and get into this stuff and loving it and, and discovering the joy of world building, whether you're playing or GMing or whatever it is you're doing. And these books, though they were out of print at the time, we'll get them back into print soon, are the perfect tool, perfect toolbox, really, for all of those people who want to do that. It's just filled with a plethora of information. Uh, and Gary had it open-ended, and open ended, like I said. He really didn't envision an end of it until every subject matter of world building and adventure design and, and, and uh, character design was, was covered. So what we'll do, and this Kickstarter is we'll offer the seven that we've uh, already written and were published. We're going to republish those. They've been out of print since 2008. Uh, you can only get them on eBay for like $300 to $500, depending on which one you were trying to get. Yeah. We'll, we'll bring these seven out and we'll use the, the stretch goals. We'll be built around kind of improving them and also the other three books that were finished but never actually saw print. So this sounds like it could be useful both for gamers but also for anyone that's being a creative so if you're writing comics yeah, or movie scripts I was or... about to say. you stole my question jr uh, for <laughs> yeah clearly these books transcend just you know world building for 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 the game table these would be very handy because i because i've seen the contents of some of them and the level of detail they offer would be very beneficial to writers too yes anybody who, anybody anybody who's a trying to figure out the, the ins and outs of, of building an authentic world. Yeah. Yes. You know, yeah. I think that's right. Whenever you put pen to paper and you're trying to create something that's uh, like livable, you know, right. that, like that would actually exist. Gary touches on a multitude of topics that you need to, that one needs to address to build that world in such a way that others believe it to be a real world, you know? Right. All those, and there's, you know, it's funny you mentioned you had an open-ended thing. That could have been hundreds of volumes. Yeah. <laughs> Are you saying Gary had no shortage of ideas and creativity? Yeah. No. Okay. That's one of the things I learned from, from James Ward working with him is because you, you could throw a one-liner about something you don't think is important and you move on. And James is like, okay, but that actually means something if that is the currency. Okay, so what does that mean about this and this? Yeah. And all the knock-on effects of things that you don't think about because they happen under the surface. And you don't necessarily have to talk about them if you're writing a novel, but you better understand it because you could break your story by writing something else later on that contradicts it. Right. Yes, no, that's very, very true. Those small details and that knock-on effect, what is it, like the butterfly effect of those small, small mm -hmm. details. If you don't pay attention to them, they can wreck your setting uh, or break that uh, suspension of disbelief, basically, is what it will do. Not right. wreck your setting, but... 
I didn't grow up uh, around a horse farm, but I know like I've got a cousin that was a horse fanatic. So one of the things you see that a lot in fantasy where the horses never seem to stop and even the poorest of the poor can afford a horse. And I'm like, so it's clearly someone doesn't understand how the equine industry works. Right? Yeah. You don't understand horse people and what the, the trials and tribulations they suffer. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think about like until you own, like when I had pets as a kid, my, my parents had dogs. I never considered what went into that. So I had a dog and I'm paying the vet bills and I'm <laughs> buying the food and trying to make sure they're healthy. And, and, you know, that's part of that knock on effect. So if someone's got a horse and they'll use that as a perfect example in fantasy, like, okay, where are they getting the feed for it? If they can barely feed themselves. Right. Yeah. And you yeah. see that a lot yeah. in fantasy. So this sounds like these kinds of books would prevent people from making those mistakes. Yes. That's what they're yes. designed to do. And like David said, it gives you a, a kind of a realistic view of what a fantasy world would be. like. Yeah. And just, you know, just as an example, using a horse and, and, and Sparky, were you raised around horses? Uh, kind of, sort of. Okay, I sort I of got them as a kid. Okay, I t okay, I sort of gathered that from your comment. Uh, so a horse is, and we had three up here for a while. They they can be a lot to take care of, but just imagine traveling with a horse in your fantasy setting. Mm -hmm. So when you stop at an inn at night, you have to have that horse has to go somewhere, right? So you have these stables, and then you have to say, well, who's stabling it? And what you end up doing is you're creating this whole world around just the horse alone, because if everyone's using horses or a lot of people are using horses, there's going to be stables. And what was one of the big things like uh, when the car was first introduced and the street cleaners in uh, New York City were complaining that they were going to lose their job <laughs> yeah, because yeah. they didn't have any poop. To, there's less and less poop to clean up. Right. Until eventually there's no poop cleaners, you know, no poop scoopers. So, yeah, there's tons of knock-on effects that you should be aware of on those things. That's cool. I didn't thought about the worst that detail before. Yeah, well, well Sparky was born in Texas, so he was born with a six-shooter on his hip, a cowboy hat, probably some <laughs> dip or a cigar, I and on a horse. He was born that way. It's just how it works in Texas. <laughs> and my better half is all about the horses, and she, she wants to get horses eventually at some point, so God help us all. Uh <laughs> <laughs> hey, that would be awesome. Do it. So, so what other, so you mentioned some of the world building books, are there going to be follow on world building books that he's already written or would you guys be adding into his creation at that point? Like where's the line uh, so, you run out of his books? So currently we have, um, we have to act under the uh, umbrella of the court order, what we're allowed to do. Now we're, we're given all of the content for the guy Galaxy fantasy world series and some other material like Castle Zaggy under this particular court order. Uh, but my intent, our intent is to do the, the seven that we previously did, the three that we knew were in the hopper. We'll take a look at the others that he had wanted to do, find out how far we were uh, you know, in, in production of these things. Or he was in production of these things. I got an email yesterday that from one of the authors from the Seafaring book that he was about halfway through it. He had 110 pages wow. of written content. So that's quite a bit of material. Uh, so that those we'll probably pursue. I'm not certain that it would would it, it would be uh, the right thing to do to keep doing works with Gary's name on them that he didn't approve. Does that make sense? I yeah, mean, some could see that like a, as a cash grab situation. And, yeah, and I mean, this, uh, this is built. This is contributing to Gary's legacy, and, and exactly. So yeah. if we if we were to if Davis and I were to oversee, say, a book on the undead, it goes in this this GFW series. Gary wouldn't have read this. Gary wouldn't have approved this. So we can't logically and honorably put our, our his name on it because he didn't see it. But now this other material, like the three books, I know he saw two are written by him. So that, you know, <laughs> pretty much there is. Uh, and the other one, I know that he saw because he sent it to me completed. It needed editing, but it was done. So does that uh, include essential places? Uh, no, that is. Well, yeah, not. Yes, that is essential places. The Waylon Smith catalog and yes. uh, the Pantheon. book. Yes, that is essential. Places. Okay. So. Are you actually going to do the seafaring one? Because I, fi I find that interesting. You have to have enough NPCs that the sailor can afford a female in every port. Because I'm told that's a requirement. <laughs> to do. So there's got to be enough women. You can't have an all male planet. <laughs> Which that that's, was, that's that the one that joke all into a gray zone for sure. Yeah, that's one of those things though. You see it a lot in sci-fi where they'll land on the planets and you, you notice it more there. 
and you look at the population and it's not enough to support genetic diversity, that's going to apply in fantasy worlds too. If you have yeah. only so many people, eventually you're going to have problems. So you have to plan for the population too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm pretty sure uh, Gary uh, accounts for this in these books because you know, I've, I've seen some of the contents and the absolute level of detail that, uh, and I can't remember which book, there was like a, a one in one of the books, he had a whole section on how much like a, you know, an acre of land, how much food he can produce with, with, with this variable and that variable. And it was just like, holy shit, this is actually valuable <laughs> to me in real life. It's like, these books are different <laughs> and like I've worked something here. Yeah, that's that's living fantasy and there's a i think in world builder there's a, a, a couple of pages on weights and measurements it's a great tool for if you're in any kind of you know planning it for the real world yeah so, that's funny sparky that you would say that because when i first started getting my kids in the tabletop role-playing games they're like you tricked me this is math and learning <laughs> <laughs> what i think it's like on the last week's stream isn't there a chart on there about the the tensile strength of rope Yes. yes. It's like, you know, it's like that level. It's like, I feel like, well, that's not going to be useful. Actually, you know, you might be surprised. You might be surprised. You might be surprised. Might be surprised. So, uh, actually, I do have one qu question. This is directed directly at Steve. Did uh, Gary write anything about uh, uh, river crossings? In, in <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did, actually. There's a whole section on river transport. So, <laughs> So do you have anything, because you see a lot of uh, fantasy and a lot of RPGs, they, they factor in religion, the, the gods of the various pantheons. Is that something he wrote about how to create that, that you potentially be publishing? Yeah, it's addressed in two areas. In one of the books that wasn't actually printed, Pantheons, he wrote, uh, and that's how to build a pantheon and how to, you know, a, a typical example and all that stuff. But in Living Fantasy, actually, there's a whole section on how, uh, you know, a magic wielding priesthood would change the way healthcare is done in the world. It's, it's, yeah, he touches on that as well. And I hadn't even thought about the magic in the healthcare, but that's part of those knock on effects you talk about. Yeah. That's, um, I mean, if, if paladins yeah. and clerics and druids can cure disease, uh, it changes the game. Or even that, illusionist. Yeah. No, you could set up. And that, that locks all, you know, most of the early development of alcohol, for instance, was because the water wasn't safe to drink necessarily right. before they knew to, to yeah. boil it. So if you have, healthy water because you have magic do they have the impetus to invent booze right. in, in, in your world that kind of get stuff. drunk they, forget they didn't problem. know it would do that until they invented it they were just trying to be uh, not Fine. Fine. i will i will point out on the booze things uh baboons enjoy getting drunk and what they do is gather around like uh citrus trees like i can't remember it's an orange tree or something like that right when the uh fruit is about to drop they gather around it and they won't let anything near those trees they will chase everything off until the fruit falls and once the fruit has fermented just a little bit enough to get them drunk they will go up and devour that fruit <laughs> so what you're saying is the baboons are enlisted in the u.s army i got it <laughs> so that there ladies and gentlemen was the educational segment of this podcast <laughs> Davis, I, I think we just became best friends i like you <laughs> So, in our blood, drinking's in our blood. So, do you cover? Speaking of baboons, do you cover like what animals potentially would inhabit? Does is the assumption just you're using earth animals, or or does it cover how to create fantasy animals that you know? There, there and the warbler touches. It's got lists of animals that you can put in the campaign setting, and they're I think they're broken around by terrain, not necessarily biome. Um, he's got a great section on trees that breaks the trees out by biome and temperature and, and all of that business. Uh, but he didn't get, he didn't, one of the books that he wanted was a monster book and he didn't get into a whole ecology of monsters in the series that we have now. It's touched on in the various books, Living Fantasy and World Builder, uh, but not, not in the detail that I know that he would have done it when he, you know, dove into that. So uh, this is more of a statement and I'm kind of curious if, if you agree with it. Would you say books like these are probably more important now than they ever have been? Because right now with the internet, being in kind of a weird place like when's the last time you actually found what you're looking for on google easily <laughs> Never. You know, like, yeah. say i broke davis you know what i mean it's, <laughs> i know exactly like, what find, you mean. finding information is harder now than it's been in yes. a long time and having all these uh books with this wealth of information in a concentrated form i think it's almost as worth its weight in gold <laughs> oh yeah well i would agree sparky the uh 
so when the internet so i remember when the internet first arrived in the, back in the good old days yeah back in the good old days and there was a while it seemed like finding good information on the internet it wasn't i mean it wasn't it was never easy but you could find it you know yeah. peer reviewed papers yeah uh because the only people who went to the internet were really tended to be really well informed but only ones who would sit there and write these long articles and stuff like that on subject matter but since that time i think roughly 2009 2011 somewhere around in there it started to switch up such that now I you, no, I don't I hardly even bother going to Google anymore. Hence I started Dang. building my bookshelves and getting my books all back out. Yeah. And you know, using Living Fantasy and wishing that I were close to a university library again. Uh, because it's easier to access good information at libraries or in books now mm -hmm. than it is on the internet. So uh, I'll I'll answer that with a perfect metaphor. So earlier I was listening, I got a record player behind me where I was listening to a Cult of Source Erectus by Blue, Blue, Blue Oyster Cult. Uh, the Thank record player, it goofed up and it wouldn't work. So I turned it off, figured it was overheating, but I wanted to hear the album. So I went to YouTube, opened up full album, you know, Blue Oyster Cult. Model. And it was playing Monsters, which is probably my top, in the top three of my favorite VOC songs. And in the middle of it, and Monsters is a fast paced song. It's a very fast paced, <laughs> it's great. It's great to, you know, write to and stuff. In the middle of it, it stopped, and some weird dingy dingy music came in, and they were selling some kind of soap or something. I don't know. <laughs> it took my brain like ten or fifteen seconds to realize, wait, what happened? How did my train wreck? What, what's going on? <laughs> it switched to a second advertisement, so I just I cut it off and I worked in silence for an hour or so until my record player could cool down a little bit. And that's what the internet's become like. You go yeah. to look up something, and this like I want to do a name. I'm going to do a name generator. <coughs> First, I'm going to have five sites that are all blanketed in an advertisement that are mm -hmm. mostly probably yes. spyware and whatever oh, yeah. you watched on your computer well, it's just a pain i, I don't do it i have just quit <laughs> as a little a little uh, side note there is last night a matter of fact i was looking on i was looking at something and i know it's wikipedia but there's at one time Wikipedia, you know, if you took it with a grain of salt, you could like get, get the highlights fine. But I got to look into this entry and I'm not going to go into, into it cause it kind of veers into it. It's been a 20 year running edit war mm -hmm. over, pol over political spheres, I thought. And, and it's just, it's just, com it's complete insanity. Yeah, and, and they cut out all the the information that's actually valuable to just you know try to argue over just stuff it doesn't matter, and this, that's the whole the internet in a nutshell. And that's yeah. and that, to play into your question. I remember a few months ago, my son was doing a, a paper on Lenin, and he saw something on the internet that Lenin died of lead poisoning. Uh, and he kept all this weird googly goop information. So I've got a pretty extensive library out there, mostly history books. So we pulled out three books that bio, bios that I had on Lenin, and we went through them all, and we found out that it was a German doctor that said he died of lead poisoning caused by the type of bullet that he was shot with back in 19. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I asked my wife, I said, is this actually possible? And she's in the medical field. She says, yeah, it's absolutely possible. Uh, so the lead, the lead that eked into his blood had something to do with it. But what, what Wilson had in front of him were three books that cited material sourced by historians who are pretty – dry, you know, pretty boring sometimes because they're just yeah. reciting what happened, but it's actual valid information. And I think that when you get the, the Gygaxian Fantasy World Series in your hand, when you get these seven books, you're not going to have to deal with any of this stuff. You're going to open this book. Uh, the book of names is a hundred thousand names in there. Uh, that, that section has, it's the first section is the importance of a name, how to create, how to choose a name. The second section is names from ancient Phoenicia Germ modern Germany, ancient Germany, modern France, Polynesia, China, Japan, Arabia. I mean, it's 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 a hundred thousand names. And then the last section is how to create fantasy names. So it's it's this just a wealth of information that you can open up in front of you. You can read in the bathtub. You can do whatever you need to do. And we're not going to put any advertisements in it. We're not <laughs> 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 Nothing's going to pop out at you. It'll be great. And and one thing I want to mention on that too. To Ken's point, though, that a lot of the material in there is very, very, very well researched. So the book of names, for example, the hundred thousand names; these are all 
actual names of human beings, yes. you know, stretching back into antiquity, you know, broken down, you know, Egyptian, Greek, ancient Greek, Roman, you know, Italian, whatever, you know, you pick it and it's out there. Uh, as with like the canting crew, it has an actual cant in it, a thieves cant. Yep. that is well researched and based on actual historical cants from the 19th i don't know from the, yeah, well from the 16 17 1800s yeah 16 17 and 1800s so it's all a lot of it's really 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 well researched now some of it of course gary had to create you know for fantasy but fantasy right. thing you know fantasy world building and there's no historical reference documents for that oh. necessarily but <laughs> for those that don't know a cant is a, a language that is created mostly through like jargon of a specific field so like if you have a specific sign language the thieves use so they can communicate with each other uh like david eddings did in his belgarion that would be technically a cant um c-a-n-t yes. so uh and so a lot of, you know it's funny you mentioned that because a lot of people speak a cant today and you'll find gangs speak can't yeah, true you know uh Anybody modern use? kids on the internet. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I think lawyers speak a cant too. They have their own little language that they speak. And then they charge you big bucks to, to yes. translate to you. <laughs> that, that's called Latin, people. It's just a dead language. Um, yeah, okay. But yeah, the, uh, the that's the funny thing is, it, yes, it's in like I've, I've dealt with this when writing characters that were like Australian. Like technically, we're the same language, but we're not the same language. Right. And, and that you're going to get that effect when you deal with people. With different cultures and life experiences and that's something you would have to factor into a game right yes so you mentioned there's a book uh it was on one of the pictures uh that she sent with uh, all the the books that are in this this bundle that the it's uh insedia it's uh it started with an i uh yes. which book is that that's the one that's not clear to me what its contents are that's the one that i, I can't now it's been so long ago uh insidia means uh direction or something but that's the the adventure building how to write and or build an adventure to write one for publication or to build one for your game Lord uh, it's the shortest that. of the books written by dan cross it's a great book but uh, it's basically how to create uh an adventure or adventure arc does it cover how to balance things because yeah. apparently i i when i was d dungeon mastering uh, i was sending them against things that was way out of their level <laughs> and like, almost killing yeah. whole parties and oops that's fine yeah, it's just like, oops. well, well, you know better for next time. It's fine. Yeah. I've right. always had fun with balance. I'm like, eh, eh, yeah. it's fine. Just remember, your world is unbalanced. <laughs> <laughs> That's world, the cornerstone of your world. It's not balanced. For if real you. life was balanced, <laughs> things would be a lot easier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah. This is, is the way it is there, in the real world. Fuck it is up. There, <laughs> Is there at any point a book on like, you know, Gary's advice to dungeon masters? Cause like, I, I figure I'm not alone that I stumbled into dungeon mastering because I couldn't find enough games. Cause there seems to be, that's the bottleneck for most gamers, right? It's finding someone to actually lead the game. So I said, screw it. How bad could it be? Right. I'll try it. It's all Sparky's fault. <laughs> so, is there any plan at, at some point with future? And did Gary uh, plan any of that on like advice to, to actual DMS in general, like more broadly speaking? He actually wrote a book, I can't remember the name of it now, back in the 80s that would be that very thing. And though we don't have one uh, in in this, I've actually written a book called GM Tricks of the Trade. Uh, it's actually Davis. I keep forgetting. i got to talk to you, you and Chuck about it. But uh, it's ready for print. I mean, it's just ready to go to printers. Uh, and, it, and it's that very thing. I've been running games since. And Davis started running me in games in 75, 6, and I started running in 1980. Uh, so I kind of took all of my... Uh, you know, tricks and tips and all that stuff, and put them into one large uh, Doom of Life. But we don't have that from Gary, but we do have something like that coming out for me. I'll have to find that when it comes live because I'll be buying it. But so, one of the things some gaming companies will do, and, and some authors do it too, if you buy the print copy, they kind of by default will give you the PDF or e pub or whatever format for the ebook because i know a lot of people like to read through the ebook but they want a physical copy to keep on hand for you know collections whatever is that something troll lord games does that if you buy the print you can get the the ebook with it or is it always separate purchases how's that going to work for these books so two two answers to that question if you back the kickstarter 
uh, the PDFs will be built into the level that that book is in. So that you'll, you'll get the PDF there. On our store, however, we, we sell things. Uh, you can buy the book. You can buy the book and the PDF or the PDF. And if you get the book and the PDF, you get a, a tremendously discounted PDF uh, with the book. It's usually uh, just a eight, ten dollars more, or five dollars, or what, depending on the size of the book and whatnot. Okay, so your your company, as a general policy, gives you a discount if you're getting both at the same time, yeah. um, but it's built into the tiers of you know what you yes, sub back sure. with this. So, what is your goal going to be to make sure this is funded? Like, what's the level you have to hit? We're probably going to set it at about 25,000. I'm thinking it's seven hardcover books, each of them about 200 pages long. Uh, we haven't dis- decided whether they're going to go full color yet or not. And we may oh. build that into the Kickstarter or not because they don't really need to be full color. And when you go full color, you got to go with a heavier uh, uh, gloss paper, usually 70 pound gloss, mm-hmm. and which makes the books heavier. And But it also doesn't that page that page isn't going to hold the printed word. I mean, it holds it well, but not as well as a sixty pound text that will hold blah blah blah. But so, we're, <laughs> so we, this is what Davis was talking about earlier. I'm really getting into the, the manufacturing side of it. But uh, so we'll, we'll determine whether they they're going to be full color. We're kind of leaning in that direction, uh, but we'll see. But they'll definitely be large, uh, you know, two hundred page hardcover, eight and a half by eleven. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, black and white on the right paper holds longer than color on so any paper, paper ever. It's a little smear. It print. It print. I've learned so much Very about printing yeah. and paper yeah. since meeting yeah. you guys. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but will you will you employ monks to decorate the pages with the little uh, pictures on the side? Hey, Chuck! <laughs> I'm going to chop for you. You know, my, my daughter <laughs> just finished a, a year stint overseas studying medieval manuscripts. And she would send me those those little pictures that the monks drew. Those things were hysterical. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was um, one of my two interns at a, as a grad student at Nova was uh, working in the um, ar- special collections archive and like um, I want to say photocopy, but uh, scanning. There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. I was scanning all of those, and so one of the collections they had was, was like one of the most famous uh, Irish monks, and I can't remember his name now. It's been <clears throat> too many years, uh, but I like looking at some of those in the margin images and little notes that are there. They were a hoot. They're hilarious. Oh, you can no. just see some bored monk drawing. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's something you, you mentioned books because you're a bibliophile. Do you cover that in the world building? Because you see in a lot of fantasy worlds, people write, oh, the books were ubiquitous. They're just books everywhere because you're used to that in the modern world. But people don't factor in what books were like before the Gutenberg printing press existed. So is right. that something that's covered in the world building in the living fantasy sides of these novels? I believe it's covered in living fantasy somewhat. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. It was it was an art form, and they couldn't rush through these things, and it was people doing it hand in hand. Was that 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 crazy? I don't know if you've ever seen it, but Thomas Jefferson invented a some kind of machine that where he wrote his yeah. letters, it would write the other, it would make a copy of it while he was writing it. Yeah, I've Very seen cool. that. That is insane. Um, yeah, they thought of it back then. Um, basically, he made himself an invisible servant, and, and we all need one of those. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So is is the economy of your world something that's covered as well, like uh, in these books? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Economy yes. covered in living fantasy and world building. Okay. You mean is Gary it, uh, tackles the question makes- of, of of gold pieces and all uh, everything? Goes- <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm just thinking. Like, <laughs> Sparky and I were in a lot of games with James Ward that we were told were done the old school way, and what I learned is we would hire people and they would always die. <laughs> so you make you wonder, do you have like, like killing people? horses too? Yeah, do you have like life insurance packages for your employees because you know you've got the reputation as the guy who kills off your henchmen? Yes, <laughs> Gary was pretty, uh, if probably a few friendly arguments we had about that, he wanted to ditch the gold standard, the gold piece standard, and replace it with the dollar standard and create an economy of scale for all of this stuff. His uh, own Bretton like, Woods agreement. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't do that. That's crazy. <laughs> but it does make you wonder what the creature at Jekyll Island really was now that we've got fantasy because the creature might actually be something. I don't know, a crazy succubus or whatever. 
if you know, you know people. Yeah. Um, so, so what was the what was the consensus? So, did you end up in this book? <laughs> create your own dollar? Is it backed by gold it's, and silver? It, he created a dollar system. It's in there. I can't remember which one, but I think it's in I think it's in Living Fantasy, but I can't remember. Now. It might be in Nation Builder. It's in Living Fantasy, I believe. Yeah. It's in Living Fantasy. Yeah. So he he created it, but we didn't go through and change everything too. But I think World Builder also lists things in a dollar value, doesn't it? Uh, it might, it might. I remember it was quite a long discussion that he had over that. It went on for quite a while. <laughs> oh, to be a fly on the wall for that one. Yeah, it was funny. It was all in good. I mean, because he was, Gary was great to work with because he, he was the creator and the writer and we were the publishers. And we had actually, uh, so it was brings me to a, a question. What was the creative process with Gary like? Uh, well, it depends on the project. So we didn't do writing for him. He wrote or he had ideas and he hired editors. And so he created eventually when we first started working with him, he was just kind of sending us manuscripts that he had finished and we began working right. with things. Um, but then as steam began picking up and I think he began developing his own company, Trigy, kind of building, fleshing it out, he started hiring writers to write for him. So he would basically pitch ideas to us. Uh, and this is what I want to do. And I don't, I don't think we ever said no. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. I'm not doing that. Do you want to be the man that said no to Gary Gygax? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and, they were, and they were great ideas. So why not? And the funniest, saddest conversation that uh, that I had with Gary was just before he crossed over. We were up there at the Winter Dark, and he sat down, and we went over the Kings of England, Kings of France game. Uh, and he had sent the game to us. Peter Bradley and I had kind of put it all together and done the art and laid the cards out, mostly Peter Bradley. And then I presented it to Gary and we went, we were sitting at the table and I remember we went through each card, card by card. He read them all, made corrections or notes or whatever. Uh, and then at the end of it, he said, well, this is what I would like to do. This is what I'd like us to work on in the future. Uh, and we proceeded to have like an hour. I can't remember, Davis, if you were there at the conversation or not. No. And we, we had a conversation like an hour and a half somewhere in all of this troll mess. I've got the notes that I wrote down, but I remember seeing Davis shortly, shortly thereafter and saying, good, sweet Lord, we're not going to have enough time to do any of our own projects because Gary's got, he's working more than he's ever worked in his life. And he wants to do all of these, all of these projects. Uh, but, and of course that all comes to an end, but uh, he was in, insanely, uh, energetic. He was fun to work with. He was easy. He would send an email over. This is what I'd like to work on. This is what I conceptualize. Uh, I would digest it or whatever, run it by Davis. Uh, Mac had left the company at that point. Um, and then, you know, yeah, Gary, however, and he turned the manuscripts over. We would do the art and the layout and the editing and uh, trade dress and all of that was, was, was on us. But uh, he, he and his team did the writing. So you, you've got the Kickstarters for the world building how-to manuals. Um, are you guys ever going to come out with some of the um, Gygax? I think there was a castle you mentioned he designed that was going to get published. What, what's going on with that? So the, the court order that we have now, that includes all of the material with the Gygaxian fantasy worlds and all of the material with Castle Zagic and a few other properties. Uh, Davis's favorite Hall of Many Pains. Uh, the Hermit, uh, which we've just done, and the uh, Kings of England, Kings of France board game. But uh, so the Castle Zagig material is absolutely monstrous. It involves the town of Yigsburg, which is finished, uh, the East Mark, which is the region around Yigsburg, which is finished, and the bluff where Castle Zagig sits, which overlooks East Mark and Yigsburg. Uh, and portions of that are finished. He finished, there's the Castle, Castle Zagig itself, which has three areas the precincts the foundation and the towers those are done written by gary gygax and jeffrey Telanian. and then the mouths of madness which are the caves on that bluff those are done written by jeffrey Telanian uh, of north wind adventures and uh, gary gygax and then beneath that are 17 levels of the dungeon uh those are not written the first level is the the other 16 are not but we will be doing all of those levels we've got gary's notes gary's maps uh, we've employed Mike Stewart, who is well known in the old school AD and D community. He's worked for us for years. He's worked on his own for years. He knew Gary. He worked with Gary on Yigsburg. So he's very well in tune with what Gary wanted, uh, or at least Gary's style, I should say. And we have Gary's notes. So we'll be doing the 17 levels, but we won't be doing anything beyond that. Gary had, unless we find notes on it, Gary had open, much like the GFW series, he had open ended Castle Zagig, the dungeons. Uh, I remember once I, I made a, did a press release where I talked about we're going to release the 17 levels of Castle Zagic, and he shot me an email 
I've got it somewhere. He said, oh, so now you're the arbiter of how, how big Castle Zagig is and how big the dungeons are. It was really <laughs> funny because clearly <laughs> he had more uh, he had more levels that he wanted to do. But unless we can find Gary's notes on, on said levels, we're not going to do it. We'll, we'll, do, we'll stick strictly with Gary's stuff. And Castle Zagig, for those who don't know, is it, it's Gary's culminating work. It's it's the the place. It is the most famous castle. We can't use the name, the original name. Uh, that's locked down in copyright. We can't use Greyhawk. Oh, that now. Uh, yeah. You yes. can't use the name Castle Greyhawk. Because, oh, you said it again. No. Yes, <laughs> this is of the coast owns it, so we can't use that name. But it's the culminating work. It is the place where all those, not all, but, you know, thousands, years and years, decades of adventures occur. You know, and it's one of his, It no, it's his most famous. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, place. and it's never been published as to Gary, as Gary right. wanted yeah. to publish. There's been a few, but never as Gary envisioned. Yeah, no, but this is know. yeah. So this is it for anyone who wants the Gary Gygax thing. This would be it, Castle Zag. And yeah. is that coming out soon, or do you have uh, plans for that one? So we've got uh, the Kickstarter on the GFW series first quarter. Uh, the second quarter, we're going to be doing redoing the Player's Handbook, Castles and Crusades Player's Handbook, CKG, the castle we've got in Monsters and Treasures, uh, having removed all of the open gaming licenses from it and the SRD material. Now we're deep in that. So second quarter will be a Kickstarter on those three books, and third quarter we're planning on the first section of Castle Zagging, which will be mm -hmm. the castles, uh, the Mouths of Madness, and maybe the first level of the dungeons themselves. Um, and is this, um, the Castle Zagat, is that in a generic world? Is it in the worlds that you have for Castles and, Cru and Crusades, which, whose name I can't pronounce, but you and I have talked about that before, the worlds you created. Yes. If you're tired, you can pronounce it however you want. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's right. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> uh, so, it's in, so it's set above the East Mark Foley, or the East Mark. And the East and Yigsburg and Yigsburg is a town. Man, is it eight thousand people, Dave? Is it like eight or nine thousand people? It's the size of that town, and it's a, a port town on a river. Uh, and the East Mark is, I don't know, twenty-five square miles. It's not very big. And there's Castles Agic. So uh, you can take it and put it in any setting that you are playing. Homebrew, our world of Eric Davis's and Zaya, a Greyhawk from the old world, or Eberron from I guess that's fifth edition's world. Um, you know, Forgotten Realms. I don't know any more worlds beyond that. But you can <laughs> you can put it in, in any in any setting that you want to because it's small and contained, but highly okay. detailed. <laughs> highly detailed, yes, very highly detailed. Highly detailed. <laughs> so when you release the um, these books, we've talked about the the game books. Is there any? Because I know Gary was pretty famous for the maps. Him and James were, were pretty big into that. Are Is there any plans on how to do the mapping stuff, a book on that for people that want to learn how to make the cartography work? So we'll do it. We're, we'll publish this in two ways. Uh, the maps will come out. They will come with each book. will come with a series of maps that are kept in a folder in the back of the book. It's kind of glued to the back of the book so that you can access the maps that go with that portion of the setting itself. Uh, Chuck uh, Cumbo, who works for TLG, he is very, very insistent on creating player-friendly maps so that they can, we can use them on VGT and you can, you know, cut off the DM's notes and room numbers and all of that stuff. So they'll be, they'll be available in that. As for a how-to, we hadn't really planned on, on doing any kind of how-to with the maps or how to create your own or what have you, because they will come with a, a mountain of maps that uh, the setting calls for. Well, I was just thinking, you know, you mentioned a castle and there's a lot more than people think when you design a castle because you get does the foundation is can it be supported by the the ground around it? Oh, yes. uh, building a castle in the march in the marshes isn't gonna work so well. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so you, know, just, you mean the moat house is in prime real estate? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, so it's in a small it'll be there fine, right? No. Is that something that might have been uh you know covered when you're doing the world building into, I guess, the living fantasy then? Is that the kind of stuff that's in there? So there was a, I, I, now that you say castles, I think there was a castle, I'm like nine, there was a fortress building. There was a book called Fortress Building that's in that series that didn't arrive at our desk. And I don't know if it was ever written or partially written or what have you. So that certainly would have been in that. But I can tell you now, when he built Castle Zagging, when he wrote Castle Zagging, it definitely covers the sediment and the rock and all that stuff that the dungeons and the castle itself are cut through. But we sadly we don't we don't have a how to 
uh, from the GFW series that wasn't part of the seven, nor is it part of the three that Google probably. Well, you, you've mentioned you've published some of your own how tos through Trollor Games. Is that something you guys have covered already? So we have not, but I will tell you that Peter Bradley and I have been working very quietly behind the scenes on a Castles book. Uh, basically, nice. what I've asked him to do is take uh, actual historical real world castles like Harlech Castle, and I believe it's in Wales. And I want a very, very detailed map of the castle, uh, you know, scaled to playability, but also one of those cutaway drawings that shows how people lived in it. And then and Davis doesn't know this yet, but Davis and I will be writing the histories of the castle and how to make it playable in your game. That's one of the things I learned accidentally. <laughs> with, with Davis will find out about that later this year. <laughs> Davis looks very happy about this uh, revelation. That's one of the things I learned incidentally when we hired the um, I hired a cover designer who did the map for one of the books I wrote. And I had when I gave him my sketch map, I had inadvertently drawn a castle that actually exists in Wales. And I asked the the illustrator that because he'd been there. And he's, well, castles, its form follows function, right? So there's going to be a lot of sameness. If you describe the right terrain, anyone that built a castle there is going to build it the same way for the same yeah. reasons. Right. And so but knowing what those those factors are when you're designing is going to affect how you, you lay that out. And I, I think some of the games I've seen, I'm like, yeah, you just gave yourself a giant blind spot to attack that place because you didn't factor all that stuff in. Yeah, no, that's true. That The form follows function and the... Uh, castles whether you're talking about hills for hill forts or uh castles and say like western france uh versus castles that you would find in say the levant built in in the same time period all of there there's some similarities in uh like the nature of that construction like you know the crenellations and stuff like that and some defensive bulwarks different types of stones and different types of foundations and different types of armies or opponents require different types of castles and you will find that prop you know you, that is supported by localized you know castle structures which are all very similar like in this time period and range you know uh and geography but as soon as like the nature of the armies change or you know the nature of warfare changes the castles change appropriately and they're built in different places or in different manners so for example when cannons get introduced this is when you get the star-shaped fortresses getting built yes. and what, what they move to is those really really thick earthenwork walls you know it's stone faced but it's earth throughout the whole thing until you have the other stone face on the interior uh but you get these star face so you get these you know what is it called inflate shots and stuff like that uh but where you found that same construction interestingly enough was in france uh during uh, gaul at the time when caesar was attacking the time what time period just before that they also had big earthenwork walls because they were easier to construct and more and and let's say equally durable considering your opponents as stone walls would be okay so the people of gaul would have these or prior to really pretty much caesar's invasion like these wooden big huge wooden log exteriors just filled with earth because you could build them quicker you know wood was readily available whereas stone you know had to be worked and cut and stuff like that and this is why and this is why we'll have davis write this book <laughs> <laughs> those things well, that's one of those things that most people don't realize is when i know um the History Channel for a while, when they actually pretended to talk about history, they had a, a series where they would... You mean the UFO channel? <laughs> hey, what's wrong with aliens? Two warriors that never met in real life and what that would look like. And mm -hmm. one of the things that they harp on for the average person that I learned as a military historian is, and yeah, I know we're running on time, <laughs> but uh, is, is the weapons, the defense and offensive weapons and protective equipment, all it's a yin and a yang. As you develop A, I counter with B, and it goes back and forth. And so what you have in your world is going to be sort of proportional to what the enemy is going to have. And that's part of the world building, too. Is Yes. Yeah, I think incorporating that arms race that goes back almost, 
I would probably say 100 to 250,000 years. <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, think, I think we're just best friends. I, I'm liking you more and more the more you talk. You know, Dave is a smart guy. He should write a uh, arms and armor book. That's what he should do. <laughs> I mean, he's got spare time. He doesn't have anything important to do. Wait, wait. What am I on right now? The cost of weapons and how to generate them. <laughs> You're almost done. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. No. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've sent over. I will say I have sent over. All the big files are in editing now. Or they're queued up. They're queued, they're queued up. They're queued up for editing. All the big files. Now it's just finishing up like the smaller files. Yada yada yada. That's for those who don't know that Davis is finishing up a book called Adventurer's Armory for Castles and Crusades. So as we as we bring this home, I know you guys are tight on time. Um, when you write these books and when Gary wrote the ones that you're publishing that were his, what would you say the age level of, of the readability is? Because obviously some gamers go as young as five and six, right? But not all books can be written for a five-year-old. Uh, so what would you say as far as the the tomes that you're producing, these these books, what would the age range be where it's probably okay for them to understand it? 10, 11, 12 and above, I would think. Um, some of it younger, like the, the world builder is uh, half of it is just lists. So any, you know, anyone can pick it up and kind of go through it, but probably for, you know, to kind of get what's going on in them, I'd say around 10, 11. Yeah. I think digesting it. Now this is what I'm going to suggest, especially for those of you with children is uh, even if they're eight years old and can barely read a word, throw it in front of them. It doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I got to say, and they, okay. Davis has got kids. I got kids. Kids are actually a lot smarter than people think they are. So <laughs> they can and, take it a lot. And some of it's written in uh, like I get what's called Gygaxian prose. So, and Gary used some archaic words, uh, sentence constructions that stretch back like into the 19th century and stuff. But anyway, it's really nice to read Gygaxian prose. And it, your chance to learn new words it goes up astronomically yeah, as soon as you start reading it. And it can, you know, veer off into like, you know, crazy amounts of areas. As you look up the word. That's you know. true of Gygax, but Davis, not to stroke your ego or anything. I have I can tell the uh, materials you've written and some of the word choices you make. I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to have a dictionary here. I got to look this up. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've, you've, you've expanded my knowledge too. <laughs> That's um, one of the things that you, you learn when you're trying to go from having been academically trained in writing to uh, write fiction is sentence structure is different because uh, academics, the more commas, the better. Like you want to put 12 yeah. conjunctive clauses, rock on. Uh, your editor on the fiction side, not so much. <laughs> and I use, I use commas like candy, you know. <laughs> I, I had to learn not to, so I feel your pain, sir. Is yeah. there anything about this Kickstarter that we didn't cover um, that you, you think we, we need to before we let you guys go? You know, yes, the early bird special, Kent. Go over the early birds. That's true. I completely forgot about that. So we, we've, uh, of course, I don't know when this is going to air, but uh, we do have for early bird, yeah. there'll be early bird special with it. Uh, where you're going to get uh, entered into a raffle uh, for some very interesting stuff that we'll announce later this week or early next week. Um, but uh, the Kickstarter will be, will be structured such that you don't have to buy all seven books. You can get one or more, you know, one or two or three or four. Uh, or all seven, however you want to do. Yes. What is this, the timeline for the early bird special? I can adjust when we air this to make that a viable option. So the early bird special is probably going to be the first 24 hours, maybe 48 hours of backers. Uh, we launch on the 11th, uh, and anyone who anyone who pledges, and of course they're going to have to stay a backer all the way through the Kickstarter. Their name will be entered into a raffle to to win, and plus you'll get uh, you'll get a free PDF of all the books, but your name will be uh, of the original books. Uh, your name will be entered in this raffle to, to win some interesting material from the Troll Lord Dungeon. We're pulling three items from the dungeon that will be highly appreciated by the That's audience. ominous, gentlemen. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've missed my friend. He was a gnome. He went missing in one of your adventures. Could I have him back? <laughs> <laughs> JR's gnome is returned. <laughs> um, so, all right. So I will air this before this I launch. I blended them up. I'm drinking your gnome. <laughs> 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 Oh, Interesting. Actually, no, 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 I gotta let you go. That could, could, could lead a whole nother yeah, disruption. No. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so I will air this before you launch then. So, so that way everybody that's listening, if you listen to it in time, you can back it in time Excellent. and uh, and maybe enter that to win. Um, and we will go from there. So the David, how prize. mystery prize, how can listeners and viewers at home find you uh, on the wild, wild interwebs? 
Twitter. Okay. I'm, and, uh, uh, I am I am pretty active on Twitter and uh and let's say the Troll Lord Games Twitter page. That's mostly Dave. It's a little bit of gray slide today. Yeah, that's the difference. That's yeah. my uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's where I expunge ideas. Uh, is on Twitter or I find something interesting on Twitter. And that's where I contact people as well. If I find something interesting, uh, I typically repost. I, like, I think uh, I repost y'all stuff a lot. Uh, you shared some of our episodes, yeah. Yes, yes. And then uh, I find particular things interesting, and I'll contact people as well. I actually really like talking to the fans. So that's one of the worst things about me going to a con is I don't really do anything other than just talk to people. Because <laughs> I <laughs> you get a kick out of this then, Davis. When we did the interview with Steve Chanel when he Steve, why am I saying your last name when you're right there? When we interviewed Steve about his um when he was when you guys were introducing the world that that the uh, for the castles and crusades, yeah, and it hadn't gotten shared by your people. And I reached out because Chuck had been the point of contact. He goes, No, 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 social media, that's Davis's fault, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, uh, Steve. How can listeners and viewers find you at home if they want to? Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> come come on, find find me. Discord. Sometimes he's on the Discord. Yeah, sometimes Discord would probably be the best. Yeah, Discord's the best. I, I get on Facebook a little bit, but I forget about Facebook. I forget. About, I got a Twitter account. I forget about it too. Uh, I do run an AMA. This is probably the best way. Uh, Spark and I talk all the time on my AMA on Tuesdays on Twitch. Uh, four thirty. I rarely miss that show. So four thirty Central Standard Time. Uh, I I, it, I just open it up and I'll chat with anyone who comes in about just about mostly movies and books and comic books. Aliens, <laughs> aliens, and Dr Pepper, and Dr Pepper, and I'm cheeseburgers, an alien cheeseburger, and Dr Pepper fan. So there's there's a lot of that. Ooh, now I want to know if you could cook an alien into a cheeseburger to drink with you. Dr. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <And a gnome. laughs> All right. So and. Uh, that's a million dollar idea. Is it? <laughs> is it? Is it really? No, you start a burger joint called uh, Alien Burgers, you know? And there then you go. That is a good idea. Okay. That's right. a million dollar idea. Oh my it God. probably already exists in Area 51 and, and all oh, those, like, yeah. like, whatever. Um, but okay, yes, so we're in a food truck now. Yeah, he's <laughs> got free time, he doesn't have anything else to do. No. Um, so we will link to that and we will link to all of the troll lord game stuff, which is who knows how many of their minions manning, but but their discord community is very active. Uh, if you're looking as a new dungeon master, as a new player, uh, I have never asked a question there that I have it within like 15 seconds, been bombarded with a hundred different answers. <laughs> Sometimes the answers are more than you ever wanted. Like, dude, I just wanted to know what dice to use, not like how they're made and where they're like, I don't know. Uh, it, it's a great community and, uh, and they fostered that and they keep it pretty apolitical, just, you know, family friendly shenanigans and what's not to love and dead gnomes apparently. Cause and dead like, gnomes. <laughs> Is that something that started with Troll Lord Games, or was that something that? That's Davis. That's Davis. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, all right, and then uh, with that, I appreciate you guys coming on. You can find us on our link tree, l i n k t r dot e e link tree slash blasters and blades podcast. Again, link tree slash blasters and blades podcast, where we link to all the things, the bit shoots, the rumbles, the YouTube, our Twitter, our email, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com for professional purposes only, people. Keep the shenanigans over to Madam Stabby's Instagram, Twitter, or email. You can send her all the hate mail. She loves it. She loves it. Uh, she'll make you cry in response, but that's on you, people. That's between you and your priest. Uh, and with that being said, we also link to our Facebook group and Facebook page. Uh, you can also follow us on our website at anchor.fm slash blasters tech and tech blades. Again, anchor.fm slash blasters dash and dash blades, where for as little as 99 cents a month, you can help keep the lights on, or you can support the show more directly over at buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com slash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put it in the comment section that it's for the podcast, and I will promise I will keep my co-hosts duly caffeinated. They will drink until the coffee brand coffee pours out of their eyeballs, people. It's glorious. We should film it, charge admissions. You'll love it. Uh, and that is use the code podcast grunts with the link below and you get 10 percent off Ooh, coffee and fantasy worlds. That ought to be its own book. Anyway, I digress. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us for my crazy co-host. I am JR. And this was the blasters and blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture 
cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. Thank you two for coming on. This was way too much fun. It's hard to believe I can call this work, but I'm I'm here for it. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thanks for, thank you for coming thank on, you. Sparky. I'm going to rope you. you into some more episodes, Sparky. You don't need to sleep. Oh, and Dune is coming on in three days. Dune too. That's right. <laughs> well, it's it's already on when you when we air this, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Wait, it's out? No, no, Davis. They're going to air this show later. Oh. So 